I, I actually quite like hiding behind the lectern. Um, does that sound all right? Not too loud for people. Um, it's lovely to be here, and I actually just wanted to say a couple of words, because Mike sounded very modest. He was kind of editing himself out of the story, I think. Just wanted to really thank you, Mike, because you've, um, I think you were very instrumental in getting the Helsinki conference going. And again, obviously, uh, in New York. So thank you for your efforts. And it was very nice to see your introductory comments. It reminded me, I think, of why we did this conference in the first place. And it is an ongoing project. So I do hope that we see a New York statement. Um, I can't see you if I go behind yeah. this. <laughs> so I think I'm going to stand to the side. Is that OK, people? Yeah. Okay, now please forgive me. I'm going to speak rather quickly um, because I, one of my problems is I try to say too much. So I'm going to assume that you're a highly intelligent audience who's going to listen very closely and you're going to take it all in very quickly. Uh, and then we're going to have a nice debate with Bruce afterwards. Um, all right, so you'll see the title. Many of you will know that I do a lot of work with critical reflection. Um, and I don't think I talk about anything else these days, so it's rather a luxury um, still to be able to talk about it. Why have I chosen this topic? Um, you see, I looked for the most complicated type for you, <coughs> because I do feel, what, what I've learned from doing critical reflection for many years with practitioners is that it does feel like practice experience is mysterious. It is wonderful. I am often filled with a sense of wonder when I hear about people's experience. It is also highly changeable, very, very complex, and sometimes I wonder whether it's actually possible to capture experience, which for me is becoming one of the prime reasons that I would want to do research. And so what I want to talk to you about a little bit is how I think critical reflection can help shed a bit more light on experience. For me, it's, that's still a challenge of research. What's, what's reflection, experience, practice got to do with each other? Um, what I've learned, I guess, is that doing critical reflection can get up to a depth of understanding experience, which perhaps just doing a normal interview, so to speak, might not. Um, so I'm really equating understanding experience with understanding practice, okay, because I'm talking about practice experience as a holistic entity, if you like. And, and that how many things are integrated in understanding that, like emotions, obviously, ideas, the materiality of the situation and of people, our actions themselves, and actually the context I've left out and how it all comes together in terms of meaning. Now, you see, I'm setting a very difficult agenda now for research, but this is what I do want <coughs> us to try to tackle. What do I mean by reflection? Um, these are two, I guess, really pretty simple definitions that I work from. I guess learning from experience is accepted as one of the most basic understandings of reflection. I've extended that to thinking about making meaning of experience, which I think is a more in-depth learning. Now, I've put Socrates up there because I've recently rediscovered Socrates' definition and I really rather like it because it reminds me why we do <coughs> reflection. Okay? Um, the ethical and compassionate engagement with the world is something I think that we are tending to lose in the way we speak about our experience and our world now. And I want to put it back in. And it reminds me that actually reflection has a particular purpose. It's not just thinking about our practice for the sake of it. It is thinking about it so we engage more ethically and compassionately with those around about us. Okay, what do I mean by critical reflection? My version, I'm saying, because there are so many different versions. Um, I'm still defining it as fitting within the rubric of learning from experience, but I'm really talking about the more in-depth learning, which is making meaning. How does it happen? It's a process of looking for fundamental assumptions, and in doing that, people remake their understanding of their experience, but they also remake their guidelines for practice. Now, what makes it critical? We can debate that forever. Two ways, it has to be pretty deep, because if, it does, if it's not getting to some depth, then people are not able to rework their basic principles and guidelines, and it's transformative. So it actually has to do with the way people re-engage with power and are able to change power relations. 
Okay, um, this is the way I practice it. Actually, someone, I think Lynette Joubert was asking me earlier today, have I written an article about group reflection? Well, actually, all I do is group reflection. Um, this is how it happens. You usually start with a piece of experience. So if we're thinking about this as research, that's the piece that's being researched, okay? Done in groups, using a series of critical reflection reflective questions. Now there is a whole set of theories behind that which I'm not going to go into. Split into two stages. First stage is looking for the underlying assumptions. Second stage is using an awareness of those assumptions to remake people's basic guiding principles. Okay. Alright, now please forgive me, some of you may have heard me speak about critical reflection before. I can't get away from this example. This was, uh, Barbara was an Australian social worker. That's not her real name. She worked in a, in a national level government bureaucracy and she was asked to choose an incident that she wanted to work on um, and she chose one from her personal life. So all we were saying is choose something that's significant to you that you think has some learning for you about your professional life. Okay, she chose something from her personal life. Um, it looks funny, doesn't it? She's like saying she's intervening between two angry men in an argument. And what happened is that she was... Um, on holiday, travelling overseas, had booked into a hotel where they were supposed to meet lots of their relatives who they hadn't met before. There was only booking for about half of them. So the two angry men, one was her partner and the other one was the hotel manager. And Barbara totally surprised herself because she stepped in between them physically. Um, and for her that was significant because she saw herself as a very passive gentle person who would never do anything like that. So she surprised herself. Why? Why did she choose it? She said, I didn't want to be a control freak. Those were her words. Okay? And she thought she was by, by stepping in between the two men. So she thought about her assumptions. What was there? She had some assumptions about control. Feeling like somebody always needed to be in control. Those, those were her words. Um, but she also felt that being in control was the same as taking action. So you couldn't control a situation by leaving, for instance, or just stepping back. You had to actually take some positive or constructive action as she saw it. So she thought further about what did that mean. She felt actually that she was someone who needed to be in control. Um, and she was also believing that to good professional practice means that you actually take action. You don't, there was no such thing as non-intervention from her point of view, okay? <coughs> now she kept reflecting on this herself, and these were her words again, she actually thought that underlying that whole incident was her own fear of uncertainty. And you see that she's actually worded that as an emotion, but of course there's a belief there as well. Now that was the end of stage one, that, that was the main assumption that came out for her. She then went away, I think there was about a month between that stage one and when she came back to do stage two. Uh, she had another experience in that, the meantime where she was asked to manage another project and one of the staff that she was asked to manage was resisting her. <laughs> so she said to him, you need to stay with the uncertainty. And then she caught herself because that's what she realised her problem was and here she was telling someone else what to do. How often does that happen to all of us? <laughs> okay, so she came back, beginning of stage two, and she said, actually, I recognise that, you know, that was my issue, so I needed to think more about what was this uncertainty. Um, and she said, I now understand, of course, there has to be uncertainty. Can't control it by wiping it out. Um, so what I want to be able to do is f still feel powerful in the face of uncertainty. So maybe some kind of structured uncertainty would be helpful. And I put it all in inverted commas because these were her words. And it's an important part of the critical reflection process that we actually use people's own words rather than putting somebody <coughs> else's words or theories on it because that will mean they probably don't understand it or it doesn't speak to them. So we said, okay, fine words, great ideals, something to work towards, how are you going to do it? And she said, I think what I will do is create my own emotional scaffolding. When I go into a new situation that I feel uncertain in, what I'm going to do is try to remember that actually I have encountered uncertainty before, I coped with it, wasn't comfortable, it was hard, but I coped with it. 
let me at least remind myself that it's doable and I've done it before. So there wasn't even necessarily any content that she was taking from that, but it was in emotional bolstering, if you like. And that was, so you see she was starting on the track of rebuilding a general principle, but also a way of starting to work with that. Okay, so that's an example of what happens in reflection. These are some of the things that I was starting to learn now from being involved in a lot of these reflections. People have great difficulty in articulating their experience and, and often when they would tell a story we would need to keep dialoguing with them to bring out their way of saying it. Of course many of the stories involved a lot of distress and trauma, not in the least surprising if you're working in social work, but many of them hadn't moved on. Um, Regularly I hear stories from 20, 30 years ago, people's first experience of removing a child from a family and the trauma is still with them. So they haven't moved on because they think being professional is that you don't express the emotion. You just, you're supposed to cope, but it's still there. Um, often very stuck in making constructive meaning. Usually the meaning they make of it is that somehow they are a failed professional, they're inadequate in some way. I just read a story recently of um, a social worker when she first became a manager uh, and uh, a client of a social worker she was supervising was killed in a fire. And this social worker, the, our social worker, who was the manager, blamed herself. And she had constructed herself as a bad manager as a result of that. Now that, unfortunately, too often is the common experience for people. Very aware of other people's perspectives, okay, and what they think the right thing is that they should think. Very difficult to find what their own voice and their own understanding is within all of that. And they often carry assumptions from elsewhere that are actually not relevant or viable in that particular situation. So they're ending up with not being able to reconcile <coughs> different sets of values. I put integrity there because for me that's often what's at threat for people. They don't feel they have integrity if they can't practice in line with what their values are. And of course a lot of people, I know we have some people from the UK here, don't we? Not willing to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, you're in safe hands. I'm from the UK now, isn't it? Um, but one of the things I ask in the UK when I do uh, critical reflection workshops is I say to people, do you actually feel you can do your job as a social worker in the job that you're in? Now, would you guess what the, the main answer is, the main response to that? That's right. Actually, interestingly, in Canada, it's yes, but for some reason in the UK, it's no. I think integrity is under threat for a lot of social workers. So that, that's some of what I'm taking. So I guess what I started to think about here was how inadequate it feels that professional or workplace theories are for dealing with some of these very, very real and deep dilemmas that, that social workers are contending with. All right, so what happens in critical reflection in relation to this? People's stories actually change. I've had people come to me the next day and they say, oh, you know, I concluded this such and such an assumption. Well, it wasn't that at all. <laughs> something entirely different. It's fascinating, actually, to hear this. There's something about going to the heart of things that enables, enables people to re-engage with what's really fundamentally important. And once they do that, it actually taps into some kind of bedrock um, that underlies their, their whole way of living, in a sense, and, and has influenced that on all of life's activities. And I'm calling this transformative. So what helps with that? They're just able to tell their story, very, very simple, being listened to. But also they have a choice of different frameworks or perspectives perspectives to try and understand it. They're doing it in dialogue with colleagues and it's in a specially enabling environment that's being set up for them to do it. I feel that we're also integrating both the personal and social side. So I, I would say experience is never just personal. It's always social as well. It's a structured process but it's also fluid and flexible. Um, so it allows us to adapt depending on what story emerges. It's intentional. It's not just talking about something for the sake of it or thinking about it for the sake of it. There is a clear set of guidelines that, that is beneath it. There are clear frameworks for interpreting experience and it is enabling because it's an ethical environment and you'll see I'm saying that it balances both safety and risk 
And I think this is something that's very hard to achieve in any environment, actually. All right, so if we're to use this method for research, because that's where I'm starting from, because I'm thinking that since a view of experience changes so much through critically reflective dialogue, what does that mean for what we understand about experience? We might get to understand it in ways that we have not formally achieved before. It is also a way of possibly combining both learning and research. So I'm, I'm also, you know, we're, we're thinking about how practice and research is combined here. I'm also thinking about how learning is combined with all of that. It is both personal and collective, because a lot of people say to me, well, it's great to reflect on personal experience. What does it mean for the organisation? Actually, it means a lot for the organisation because people are reflecting on their place in the organisation, okay, which will then influence how they operate within the organisation, which also changes the organisation. And of course we are, on a simple level, simply unearthing and developing people's knowledge or theory. And I was interested again in what Mike said about Finland, because actually I think in Finland there have been huge contributions made in terms of our understanding of knowledge construction. Okay. So the development of knowledge about practice from critical reflection is also, well, something to be mined, I guess. Um, all right, so why did I start thinking about critical reflection as a research method? Now, of course, many of you will be familiar with this statement from Denzel and Lincoln, which is obviously coming from a qualitative paradigm, but the whole idea that you can never fully capture objective reality. Okay, so that when we're doing research, whether it's more qualitative or quantitative, it's only over a partial view. Okay, so that then got me thinking about what are three major types of limitations with research, and I've, usually it comes from one perspective, okay, usually the researcher's perspective. There are therefore validity issues with that, but also then relevance issues, because it's usually done usually done, sounds like a medicine, doesn't it? Um, research is usually done by researchers on practitioners. Okay, so we then have to think about what is the relevance of that research for practitioners themselves. Right, I'm talking very fast, we'll get there. <laughs> okay, very quickly, what's the issues with the dominance of one perspective? And I'm saying it's usually the researcher perspective. So it does limit the meaning of the actual data, okay? And even the kinds of data that are collected, and we, and we can't avoid that, obviously. But just flipping it over to looking at the participants' perspective is also problematic, because there is the problem of standpointism, of it simply coming from their own one perspective. The second thing we all know, don't we, as researchers, there's often a big discrepancy between what people say, what they do, and what they know, okay? So if you just interview people, they're going to probably tell you, well, they will tell you what they think is true but that still is only coming from one particular perspective. People's experience and perspectives change. So how do you actually capture experience when it's changing all the time? Or also it's assuming a joint language. I guess when I do critical reflection, I'm constantly struck with the idea about how people use terms that we all assume we understand, like professionalism. Okay, but if you un unpick that, it has many, many different meanings. The same with the word reflection. But of course, when we do research, we don't have time to sit there and debate what the terms mean. We use the terms and we assume that the people who are answering them have the same meaning as us, and that's problematic. Meaning making is a dynamic process. Okay, it's not just done by somebody <laughs> inside their own head and then it's fed out to a researcher. Uh, okay. Whether it's relevant or not, how, what's the capacity for the research itself to be translated into action? And are practitioners' interests represented? I'm, and I'm sure in this audience they are. But I guess that's not, it hasn't been the norm and it hasn't been the mainstream. Um, and I've, I've separated interests and experiences too, you see, because I think often in traditional settings we've been used to thinking about the fact that our experience is somehow not relevant. Okay? Um, so I actually think both need to be combined. Um, and we also know that doing research does assume separation between those different worlds. So even just uh, expressing it is problematic. So what forum do you express it in? And in what form? Okay. All right, so how does critical reflection help? So I'm calling it these three things. The process that I described to you, 
is dialogic, it's also integrative, and it's transformative. I've got five minutes. <laughs> I'm going to have to collapse after this. Um, <laughs> all right. Around with <laughs> I'll need a drink. <laughs> um, okay. Being what I mean by this is what, what I find happens in the critical reflection process, it is a dialogue between the person who's talking about their critical incident or experience and the group who's helping them try to reflect. So it's actually a co-created representation of experience. So it's owned by the person. So Barbara, they were Barbara's words. She actually said, I want to have structured uncertainty. Okay, but she arrived at that way of wording it through dialoguing with the group. It's integrated. Again, I um, this this bit is a little bit problematic for me, but I came at this because I, I found often when looking at the idea of reflection that many social work academics would say to me, oh, well, we focus on feelings. If we focus on feelings, then that helps people reflect. And I was left thinking, well, what about everything else in experience? What happens to those things? So I really started to think about experience as actually combining all of these different aspects, emotions, beliefs, values, actions, etc., in order to make meaning. Okay? And, and I think just focusing on feelings, for instance, gives you a skewed view of experience. Often feelings can be a lens in which to enter and understand what's important about the experience. So for instance, if uh, Barbara said to me that she felt shocked when um, she uttered the word uncertainty. That would tell us something about how important uncertainty was to her and how it affected her, but it's not the whole story. Okay. So really what we're trying to do in integrating things is to find a language that helps people pull it all together. And how is it transformative? Well, it actually does, I think, bring around fundamental changes. I was having a very satisfying conversation um, with Ricky before because Ricky, who you'll hear from later in the conference, does a lot of this work in Israel and did some really early work with Fiona Gardner, my colleague, many years ago. We go back a long way. Um, but we were both saying how deep and powerful this process can be. Um, and in fact, I have had people say that it's life-changing. Now, I'm not, I, I, I hope I'm not overstating the case. It's not life-changing for everybody, obviously. But I think what it does is it gets at some level of thinking that most people don't go around examining most of the time, probably for good reason. Um, but sometimes it needs to be examined if there are things that happen to people that are left un not understood. Okay. Um, and what I love about it, for me this is particularly the critical bit, is it does provide an understanding of how yourself as a person and your own experience is linked with the social context. And once people understand that link, they are then able to make changes in their social world. And it also does reaffirm the value of practice experience. And it gives another role, a legitimate role, for the practitioner researcher. Oh, God, nearly getting there. <laughs> I hope you've understood some of this. <laughs> All right, what are some of the, method, uh, the intellectual issues? Because we might get some chance to debate some of this. Um, people still say to me, how do you use this process as a form of research? And to be honest, I don't know, because I get so caught up in helping people do the reflection that we often don't record what is happening. Um, and that needs to be thought through a lot more. Um, they are contested concepts, experience and practice. And of course, there are huge tomes written on the different theoretical perspectives on these terms. I'm still left thinking, I don't know how much that matters, actually. Uh, and this is, in a sense, where I'm coming at this in, in a way as someone who practices critical reflection, but has really come to appreciate the potential of what such a method might tell us in, in giving us an entirely different approach to, to looking at how we understand experience. Okay. There are other methods that are similar, of course, like many of the biographical and autobiographical and autoethnographic methods, of course, that which we know a lot about. I think what uh, the critical reflection process does, which is different, is it's really theorising it much more in professional kinds of terms as well. Okay, because 
Don't forget, I suppose reflection in one way was invented in order to improve practice. So we still have that, that kind of a, um, a goal, if you like, whereas autoethnography doesn't have that necessary intended outcome. So I think that what critical reflection does is potentially marry some of these methods better with our professional purpose. And do we need to develop other epistemologies? Oh, I've got one last slide, Erwin. And that's it. Okay, shall I... Um, I better get rid of this, anyway, so that Bruce can put his up. So what are we missing or getting wrong? If that, that's what I want us to think about for the moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think we'd like to save questions for Jan or, and ultimately for Bruce and both of them till after Bruce has a chance to present. Uh, I think the question that Jan left for us to think about, what are we missing, I think is probably a valuable question to think about everything we do. And uh, so I just want to acknowledge one thing that, that I'm really pleased and appreciative that Jan is here to speak. Uh, because she has another commitment, conference commitment tomorrow back in the UK, and it takes a lot out of you to make these kinds of trips. So thank you very much, Jan, for, for that. Now I'd like to introduce Bruce Thayer, who I recently learned is a clinician as well as a researcher, and uh, who is, and, and the one thing that I would a change in Jan's representation of this. You used the word debate a couple of times, and I prefer to think of it as a conversation, not an either or conversation, not a conversation about what's correct or what's best, but a conversation about how each different approach can make a contribution to our understanding and our construction of reality to the extent that we can. Now I'd like to introduce Bruce Thayer to you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really a distinct honor to share the platform here with so many wonderful people that I've known, some by reputation for years, some I've uh, had collegial relationships, and there's more than a few friends in the audience, and I hope by Wednesday afternoon I'll be leaving here with a few more friends. Uh, the topic that I'll be addressing is practice research using clinical data mining methods, building social work knowledge. Well, how did I happen to be here? Well, about a year ago, I was at a bridging the gap type of conference at the University of Houston, and Erwin uh, was one of the keynote speakers. And I was asked um, to make a comment about his presentation which dealt with clinical data mining techniques for social workers. Well, I found this paper to be very well conceived and I said so. Uh, he was sort of surprised. <laughs> uh, afterwards, we had breakfast together and he expressed uh, surprise at my openness to non-experimental research. And he later wrote me by email whether correctly or not, the image of you held by many practitioners and practitioner researchers, including me up until recently, is of someone who is entirely and inflexibly identified with evidence-based practice, RCTs, and practice-based research. Oh, that, was, that was quite an email to get from somebody of Dr. Epstein's reputation. So, and actually, I was shocked. So was my wife when she got the email. And so were my children. <laughs> so I told them of the non-experimental work that I had done over the years, and he invited me here to describe some of my experiences in clinical data mining under various circumstances, including agency-based settings as well as in academia. Our hope is that the examples I provide illustrate the scope and utility of clinical data mining as one method to bridge the gap and to encourage others, you, your students, your practitioner colleagues, to try and undertake such studies. 
Some features of clinical data mining. It's actually a variant of secondary data analysis, except instead of using large research purposes databases, such as national surveys supported and maintained by researchers, uh, the database consists of clinical and administrative data collected by individuals, agencies, and governments originally for non-research purposes. The data are gathered by practitioners and agencies. The analysis is usually conducted jointly with practitioners and researchers. The resulting publications involve the collaborative co-authorship of the practitioners and researchers, and the results are intended to inform practice, not the development of abstract knowledge. With features like this, clinical data mining, I'll use CBM from now on, are a very practical way to build bridges between researchers and practitioners. Clinical data mining research can involve many approaches, such as case histories. Freud made a, a, a whole career doing this, and we have people today who their primary method of research on practice is the writing up of case histories, usually of their own clinical work. Think of the novelist Irving Yalom, for example, who, who writes a lot about his group work. Um, there are journals devoted to case studies, um, and, and all the major journals will welcome well-crafted uh, case histories of interesting uh, cases that one sees in practice. That's a form of clinical data mining, in my opinion, where you're going back to case records and using the clinical narration that you've recorded for clinical purposes to go ahead and write and prepare a paper for a, a scholarly um, journal. You can also use CDM for other forms of research, such as conducting descriptive studies, retrospective predictive studies, correlational investigations, and needs assessments. Um, this little diagram, this little thing down here, is a man at the coalface. My friends in the UK like to talk about social work at the coalface, and that's where we're actually talking about the social worker and the practitioner in the room, to, uh, the client in the room together. So I threw in this little guy here at the cold face representing the hard work that, that social work practitioners do. Also, clinical data mining may involve group research designs such as pre experimental outcome studies, such as a pre test, post test only uh, study with no control group, or it can also involve the retrospective construction of quasi experimental outcome studies with pre tests and post tests for an experimental group and some type of comparison group. Uh, sometimes you don't have to have pretests at all, it's just a post-test only study. But these are all the types of things you can do with clinical data mining. And occasionally, just occasionally, the experiment can slip in. For example, here in the US a few years ago, the state of Oregon had about 12,000 people on its Medicaid waiting list, Medicaid, the health insurance program for the poor. I'm sorry, yeah, poor, Medicaid. And the Obama administration offered the money that was sufficient to put about half their waiting list to get Medicaid, and the other half wouldn't kind of get it. And the people of Oregon thought, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this fairly? And he said, I know, let's toss a coin, figuratively speaking. And they randomly assigned their 12,000 cases to either get the Medicaid, thanks to new funding, or to not get it. Well, then some researchers came along after the fact, and they said, hmm, you've got a naturally occurring experiment here. You did something to be fair, random assignment. Now we can take a look at health outcomes for these people two, three years down the road. And there's a social worker at Columbia University who's part of the research team in this Oregon Medicaid experiment. They're producing fabulous work on the health effects of getting health insurance. And it's a true experiment. It wasn't intended to be that way. The random assignment was done purely for administrative fairness purposes. Properly conducted CDM studies can be of tremendous value to the social, behavioral, and health science fields. And in selected areas, the accumulated evidence of CDM and other non-experimental research may permit causal inferences to be made, as in the established link between smoking and lung cancer. Nobody's ever done an RCT and assigned young people to be smokers or not and followed them up to look at the incidence of lung cancer, but there's a plethora of correlational, quasi-experimental, observational, epidemiological studies that have pretty well clearly established such a link and we can now read about it on the packets of cigarettes. However, this is relatively <coughs> rare in the behavioral and social science. And in any event, many important issues in social work practice are not causal in nature, hence true experiments are sometimes not an appropriate tool of investigation. CDM may also be extremely useful in disproving hypotheses. Sometimes disproving things is of great scientific and clinical value, as in disproving the supposed links between aut um, infant vaccinations and autism. Denmark, classic study. They have a huge healthcare system. Everybody's in it. Everybody's medical records are there. And in the natural course of events, parents are supposed to get their kids vaccinated for the usual array of childhood illnesses. Well, in the course of time, they, they came up with a cohort of about 500,000 uh, 500, children uh, with a given 
age range, and it turned out about 400,000 of them had gotten vaccinated, and 100,000 of them had not. And this is all data gathered for clinical, healthcare, and administrative purposes. Researchers came along and said, hmm, we could take a look at this data and look at the incidence of autism amongst the group who got vaccinated versus those that didn't. Guess what? There's no difference. Huge study, half a million people. And this is really important because now we're seeing a rise in diseases, an increase in, in child mortality from diseases that were virtually absent 30, 40 years ago because of the so-called anti-vaccination movement. Another good value of CDM is it's showing that psychosocial treatment doesn't work. This can avoid wasted efforts and needless expense. Going back to this pre-test, post-test study here, you do a study like this and nobody gets any better. That's really good to know. And you need not waste your time comparing it to no treatment or placebo treatment or something like that in most instances. Dr. Epstein deserves every credit for proactively presenting this method of research within the social work profession. He's done a number of articles, a number of very fine books, uh, some of which I reviewed, have reviewed in research on social work practice. And so much so that clinical data mining within social work and also in other healthcare fields is now a hot topic. You go on Amazon.com and type in the term and you'll get all kinds of book titles that are coming up um, on this issue. However, it's also a very old method. Uh, yesterday, I picked up Mary Richmond's book, Social Diagnosis, published in 1917, and she goes on and on and on about how we can use the data collected by agencies, churches, and local governments and health departments for the purposes of conducting social work research. Sidney Walker, back in 1928, used the same, the same thing in his book, Social Work and the Training of Social Workers, urging the close collaboration of social scientists and agency-based social workers to make use of agency-collected clinical and administrative data for research purposes. In the very first book ever published that's a social work research book, Norman Polanski's Social Work Research, which came out in 1960, Anne Schein has a great chapter on the use of available data, and I won't go through the whole quote here, but you get the point that it has been recognized for a long, long time in our field that agencies are holding on to a lot of data that can be very valuable for research purposes. In his classic uh, behavioral research textbook, Perlinger describes this type of research as what he calls ex post facto research. And he goes on to say, it's unwarranted to assert that ex post facto research is inherently inferior to experimental research. It can even be said that ex post facto research is more important than experimentation or experimental research. Now, what I'm going to do is present some examples of what I consider to be clinical data mining, primarily from my own practice experience. Um, I worked in an anxiety disorders program at the University of Michigan for a number of years, and some of my early practice research came from that. One of my very first publications was a clinical case study um, of treating an elderly woman. I thought she was elderly then. It's looking pretty young now. <laughs> but she came to our clinic, and she had a very severe phobia of dogs. And um, she'd been attacked by a St. Bernard a few years earlier. Um, I treated her as we usually treat people with specific phobias with a variation of gradual real-life exposure therapy. And after about eight sessions, she substantially recovered. She was just fine. She was all but wrestling with the dogs by the time we were done. <laughs> when the case was finished, it, it was such a nice, I, I hesitate to use the word cure, I'll say remission, but she'd improved so much, I thought, gosh, this is worth writing up, because when I looked in the literature prior to beginning her treatment, I found virtually nothing about using exposure therapy with the elderly. Adults, yes, kids and adolescents, yes, but elderly people, no, I didn't find anything there. So I wrote up this case history and published it in a, frankly, second-rate psychiatric journal, and they were very happy with it. And I consider this to be clinical data mining. I didn't start out to treat this lady with the idea of who I'm going to write up this case. It was only after the fact, after the outcomes emerged, that I thought, hmm, this might be something to write about. So here's the, here's the copy of the paper. 1981, one of my very first publications. Um, working in the same clinic, uh, we treated some people who fainted at the sight of blood. Um, this is a very interesting syndrome that's associated almost uniquely with people who faint at the sight of blood or injury or illness. Um, other people who have phobias may feel that they're going to faint, but they almost never do. Um, so I treated a person for fear, of, uh, for fear of blood and injections and needles. I won't go into the details of how we did that. You can leave it to your imagination. But believe me, whatever you can think of, it was worse. <laughs> and 
as it so happened, I was in the position to be taking his blood pressure and pulse while doing some of this exposure work, and inadvertently, I actually triggered a faint in the man in the clinical office. Um, I had the blood pressure and pulse data, and what I was able to show is that the nature of the fainting in blood injury and illness phobia, at least in this man, is something called a vasovagal reaction. Blood pressure and pulse go up, and then it drives down an overcompensation mechanism, and when the blood pressure goes too low, the blood leaves the brain and lose consciousness temporarily. Well, there's different kinds of fainting, and there was some data in the literature about the fainting seen in phobics. Is it a vasovagal faint? Is it a neurotic faint? Is it some other type? There's several different forms of fainting. And I actually had documentation that this guy was a vasovagal faint. And so, uh, working with my, my supervisor, an academic researcher named George Curtis, a, a psychiatrist, um, when the case was all done, uh, we were able to show that the guy was all better. He no longer had any tendency to faint. We documented that with blood pressure and pulse records. And we wrote an article, which is a case history, and of one, for the American Journal of Psychiatry. Again, based upon agency records, single case study. In this case, more than a narrative case study, this actually had a couple of graphs in it. Um, now, we didn't discover a generalizable cure for everybody who faints at the sight of blood, nor do we prove that all fainting reactions are a vasovagal reaction. But we did demonstrate that that was happening in this guy. And since that time, other researchers have come along and shown, yes, indeed, the fainting seen at the sight of blood is typically a vasovagal reaction. Um, in this clinic I worked at, we had hundreds of files of patients seen over a number of years. And at the time, there was some debate about issues relating to the ages of onset of people with different types of anxiety disorders. And I thought and proposed to my, uh, my, my supervisor, let me go back and record age of onset data for all the clients that we've got, because in our intake records, we recorded the client's estimate of the age of onset of their disorder. Simple phobia, specific phobia, social phobia, OCD, and so forth and so on. Hundreds and hundreds of cases. I laboriously backtracked them through and this is before electronic records. And um, again, keep in mind, this was data originally gathered for clinical purposes at intake. People filled out a complex form about the history of their problem, which we used to help guide a semi-structured interview when we actually did the intake. Um, when I was done, I ended up writing a paper with a graduate student named Richard Parrish and several psychiatrists and myself. Again, I was doing this as a clinician, not as a researcher. And I wrote this paper called Ages of Onset of dsm 3 Anxiety Disorders. Here's a sample graph of what I came up with. This was the reported ages of onset of over 150 people with the diagnosis of specific phobia. And you can see it's like a sort of a, a, a slope curve, very high at one end, very low at the other. So what this means is by the time you reach the age of 40, it's very unlikely you're going to come down with a new specific phobia. Contrast this for a group of 62 people with panic disorder. The distribution looks quite different. So I did this for, I don't know, six or eight conditions, and um, this is the most widely cited piece of research I've ever published. It's been cited over 300 times. The modal number of citations most journal articles get is zero. <laughs> Not just mine, everybody's. Um, and it turns out that since I wrote this paper, anytime anybody writes anything on the descriptive psychopathology of anxiety disorders, they happen to cite this paper. No complex inferential statistics were used, only simple descriptive statistics, means, medians, modes, and simple graphs. And, and again, it's the most popular thing that I've ever written. Very simple. Uh, one of my graduate students, Joe Himley, I was working as his field instructor, and there was a, the issue of a uh, condition called agoraphobia with panic attacks. And the question was, are these two things unrelated or are they somehow linked? Um, at the time, there was a DSM diagnosis called agoraphobia with panic attacks or without panic attacks. So we did a chart review study and um, looking at clinical records and we asked for the client's self-reported age of onset of panic attacks, their self-reported age of onset of agoraphobia, and then we asked them, what do you believe concerning the association of your panics and your agoraphobia? And what we found is the average age of onset for panic attacks was about 25 years, or agoraphobia was 33 years, and that 80% 80 of the clients believed that panic attacks caused their agoraphobia. Now, if you've ever worked in anxiety disorders, you'll know this is true clinically. Most people with agoraphobia have the beginnings of it early on by having some panic attacks, and the frequency of the panics makes them more and more reluctant to go out. Um, this was a small paper. Um, 
What did we prove? Well, nothing. <laughs> Ours was a convenient sample, hence we can't generalize our results. But for our clinic patients, they uh, re reportedly uh, that the agoraphobia followed the panic attacks um, by about eight years, and most of them believed that they became agoraphobic because of their panic attacks. Replications are needed, of course. Replications have been done. This finding holds up. Most people with agoraphobia have it caused by pan a previous panic disorder. We would give them some pencil and paper instruments to our clients when they completed their intake assessment. One of them was called the Fear Survey Schedule. So we had hundreds of these in the office, in the, in the client files, and um, working with uh, Pat Tomlin, a graduate student, a few psychiatrists, and Philip Wright, another graduate student, we pulled out all the Fear Survey Schedule data and did a psychometric study on FSS data and um, uh, to try and, and examine something about the reliability and validity of this particular study. This was not a prospectively designed paper. We only did it after the fact we realized we had so much data available on this particular measure that we had access to use it for a psychometric study involving real clinic patients, not high school or college uh, students. And we published that as well. Uh, Quasi-experimental study. Emily uh, Gary McCormick was working at a rural prenatal care program in Georgia helping high-risk women who became pregnant. And I was her faculty liaison, and she was telling me how wonderful this program was, and I said, well, does it help the women? Does it help the babies? She says, I don't know. I said, well, why don't you go find out? Ask the, ask your, the people you're working with and see if they have any data to show whether or not the women who get these prenatal care appointments are better off than those that don't. Sort of a simple thing. They had hundreds of thousands of dollars of funding for this program. They would load up a team of workers, social workers, nurses, other people, and they would go to rural counties in Georgia. And that would mean that the, uh, the low-income women, almost all of whom were African American, wouldn't have to drive to the doctor's office far away. They could get their prenatal care locally. She, she came back a, a week or two later saying, Bruce, they have no evidence at all that this thing works. And I said, do you have a bunch of charts of clients who've given birth throughout the years of the program? She said, yeah. And I said, do these charts contain records of the number of visits that were made? She said, yeah. And I said, well, let's do this. See if you can get permission from your boss at the agency. Take the people who made the top 25% most of their visits and pull out those who made the 25% bottom percentile, those who made the fewest visits. And then let's look at the birth outcome for these uh, women, those who made a lot of their prenatal care visits and those who made very few. Now, if prenatal care is really helpful, what would you predict of the, with respect to the birth outcomes for the women who made more visits versus those who made less? Prenatal care would result in better babies, right? Well, that's what we found. We found that the mothers who made more appointments, the top 25% of the mothers uh, who were in this program had babies with higher gestational ages when they were born, higher birth weights, and higher APGAR scores. If you men don't know what an APGAR score, ask any mother. <laughs> um, this enabled us to answer the question, are birth outcomes improved for babies whose mothers made more prenatal care appointments relative to babies whose mothers kept fewer appointments? The design, retrospectively construed, is this quasi-experimental study. Both got the same program. These people made a lot of their appointments. These people made very few. And then we have three or four or five different outcome measures over here. I mentioned birth weight. We had a couple other things too, but they didn't come out significant. So our answer to this question was an unambiguous yes. Some qualifiers. Our results are specific to this program, and there's no justification to make any causal inferences. We can't say that the prenatal care caused better birth outcomes. We certainly did not prove this program works. Why? We didn't have random assignment. Maybe the people who made fewer visits in the natural ebb and flow of life were poorer. They couldn't even afford to get to the local county health clinic. So there's threats to internal validity this design doesn't control for. But in terms of the question that was really of interest to the agency, do the mothers who make more appointments have better birth outcomes than those who make fewer? That was unambiguously yes. The agency was very pleased with this result as was Emily and the social worker that she was collaborating with and, and myself. Five minutes, okay, great. So here we published this in a second-rate journal. Um, <laughs> those of you who are academics, you're probably faced with having your students complete course evaluations. FSU does that, I'm an academic now. What I found out at FSU keeps all these course evaluations publicly available. 
aggregated by course. So you can look up to see what the course evaluation was for Bruce Steyer teaching program evaluation in the fall of 2012. Okay. There's a debate in the academy right now about the rise of non-tenured faculty and more teaching being done by adjuncts or more teaching done, being done by doctoral students. So what I did is I took a three-year sampling, not a three-year sampling, a three-year window, and I got the course evaluations for every class we taught in social work that had more than 10 students in it and was not a field class. And I divided those stacks into three piles. Classes taught by regular faculty, classes taught by adjuncts, classes taught by doctoral students. Then I looked at the quantitative benchmark that the university provost uses to evaluate teaching to see whether or not any one of those three types of instructors had better ratings of teaching effectiveness than the other. Everybody follow me so far? Okay. Um, so this can be retrospectively construed as a quasi-experimental study. Three different types of faculty. The outcome measures were the course evaluations. And what did we find? Well, basically, the three different groups of instructors are in similar course evaluations. There was no difference between the PhD full professors and the doctoral students or the community-based adjuncts. So lessons that I've learned along the way, and this is just a sampling of a lot. Clinical data mining is an excellent way to integrate research and practice and to form collaborations among practitioners, academic researchers, and students. They are very capable of helping to develop hypotheses, to test existing ones, and to undertake descriptive studies and evaluate the outcomes of practice and programs. They're not usually a robust method to justify causal inference, for which you usually need through experiments. Um, you can use this approach to help determine if clients are improved, but that's usually insufficient to think the claim may improve because of your agency services, but that's okay. Just be cautious and conservative in your claims. Alan Rubin here in the audience has written a wonderful paper where he's illustrated how people have less than tight designs, and they go ahead and say, oh, we've proved the program works. And he actually quotes the people making causal inferences from non-experimental data, and you want to be careful not to do that. Bloom where you were planted. Opportunities for CDM abound. Whether you're in an agency, a hospital, a dean, uh, your own practice as a social worker, or whether you're a supervisor, it's all there ready to be harvested. You don't need a lot of external funding. These things can be practitioner-driven, arising from the practice community, not imposed upon agencies by academic researchers. They're an excellent tool to shape research skills and a research brand of perspective among practitioners. Lots of journals love clinical data mining. I edit the journal Research on Social Work Practice. I hope you all found a copy in your, um, in your uh, bag. Um, most journals are very welcoming of this type of research. So let's go data mining. <laughs> died and gone to heaven. Uh, <laughs> but before I do, I do want to say that we all construct reality differently. And my recollection of that conference presentation was Bruce doing a PowerPoint built around the film Psycho in response, <laughs> in response to my presentation. Anyway, it, I, I really appreciate your, your presentation, the accumulation of practice research wisdom that's associated with clinical data mining, and, and as well, the understanding of the limitations of the claims that you can make using clinical data mining, and both are really important to keep in mind. I also want to say I found it striking and pleasing that in uh, Jan's presentation, uh, she began with virtually the same quote from Socrates that I did in the uh, clinical data mining pre-conference workshop that uh, Lynette Joubert and I did earlier this morning. And I think it has to do with all of these different methods intending to promote reflectiveness, to promote understanding of our own practice through research, even though the research strategies may be quite different. Before we open this to questions from the audience, I was just curious whether, in hearing each other speak, whether there are things that triggered your thoughts in the presentation by each of the other plenary speakers. And I don't know if your microphones are on. Um, yes, they are. So, Jan, was there anything that Bruce said that triggered an association with the work that you do that was consonant or different or in conflict 
that you'd like to say something about? I knew you'd pick on me first. <laughs> well, I know you have to leave, <laughs> and you're tired. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, w I was struck, actually, by one particular commonality, Bruce, and I, I think it's actually starting with the data that we have. Mm. I think, uh, and often when I talk about practice research, because a lot of people do envisage research as some new design of something that has to be created and constructed in order to gain data, but actually the data is all around us. So whether the data is our own experience or it's this information that is all around us for all kinds of reasons, it, it, it seems to me a very good starting point to think about doing research. Yes, thank you. And along those lines, I was struck by the fact that much of the data that Bruce used in the studies that he cited involved information that came directly from either the clients or the workers about their own experience. Now, it may not be in as great depth as the kind of thing that you do in, crit in your critical reflection exercises. Nonetheless, it doesn't discount the value of practitioners and, and clients' perceptions, and in fact, it, it includes them in the research process. Bruce, did you have thoughts that, while you were listening to Jan, triggered anything? Well, she comes to us from Australia, and I don't know if you can put out one of these to them. Um, I'm, I'm really keenly interested in research that helps inform practice in the sense of improving the lives of clients. Whether or not the clients presenting problems are ameliorated, whether their symptoms improve, whether they have a home if they're homeless, whether they can stop drinking if they're an alcoholic, um, whether the abuser will stop abusing, whether the abusive parent will stop abusing. And the kind of research I'm interested in addresses that pretty well. We take a look at the problems, we try and measure them, we look at pre and post if we possibly can. It's possible to have controller comparison groups, we try and find out about it. And that's my meat and potatoes, and that's what I love doing. Now, that doesn't say that other forms of research discourse are not, as, as you, not useful and valuable, but it's not what I do. And I didn't see the critical reflection piece as lending itself very readily to the kinds of outcome studies of enhanced client functioning that I, that I, that I am primarily interested in. Mm -hmm. Again, that's not to say that approach is not without merit. Let a hundred thousand flowers bloom, like Chairman Mao said. But I, I can't see how it would add to the kind of work that I do. Mm -hmm. Jan, do you see? Can I say, I think that social work practice research is a very broad church. And I do think that's one of the principles that we want to promote here. I mean, I think mm. Bruce is very right. We forgot to mention Australia. Bruce is my other influence. But I guess we're very uh, European, British in Australia. I don't need know that these are country differences or anything like that. I think it just says to me that in researching practice, there are many, many different aspects we need to research. So I would definitely say what you're doing is highly important, Bruce, and I wouldn't say that using critical <coughs> reflection would necessarily add to what you're doing, because I have talked about this as a way of understanding experience, and in a way, to me, that's also the mission of many researchers. It's social scientists as well. It's not just social workers. So I guess it's it's a different kind of a focus. Right. It would be very interesting, though, to take some of your research topics, Bruce, and see whether there might be some deeper experience to dredge in some of those that would give different kinds of insights. But again, that would be a different kind of research. So I don't think we can all do it all. Right, right, right. Now what I'd like to do is turn it over to the audience for questions. There are microphones on either side. I'm sorry. There are microphones on either side. Michael. I'm going to ask my question and then leave to get on what my daughter does from school. <laughs> um, um, this is a question, I guess, for Professor Thayer, Bruce. 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 Um, um, I was trained pretty much the way you were. I think it sounds like that. Um, uh, more, I guess, traditional, statistical. It sounds like we have similar training. Um, 
But I'm wondering if maybe you are, are overstating the difference between randomized trials and other kinds of studies when it comes to like inferring causality. Um, and what I mean is that, I mean, I was also trained that the, the best way to infer causality is a randomized trial. Um, but those have to be well done. You can't have attrition or not much of it. You can't have dropout. You can't have people not following the protocol. And so once the real world enters in randomized trials and how they're conducted, um, do you think it might be overstating the differences between their ability and other approaches like clinical data mining to infer causality? You understand the question, you know what I mean? I understand yeah. your question, and the answer is no. Um, <laughs> there are many ways to make causal inferences apart from RCTs. You can do a well-designed single subject experiment with one person and, and have such a tightly internally controlled study that you can make causal inferences. You can also have things like the regression discontinuity design that's not an RCT. Um, and certainly, uh, Bill Shaddish and other people are showing how very often quasi-experimental designs and true, true experiments come up with very similar results. But there are many, many examples in our field where initial results uh, which showed that an intervention was promising as tested with quasi-experimentation eventually were shown to evaporate when an RCT was actually applied. Do I think they're difficult? Yes. But for the last six months, I've been really busy working on a bibliography of randomized experiments authored by social workers. You can just imagine how difficult that has been. You all take a moment right now, come up with a number. How many do you think I've actually found published in English language with at least a social work author in a journal or a book or a chapter? Got that number? I found over 500. The idea that RCTs are somehow a rare or unusual methodology in social work practice is simply false. There's another question over here. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. I th I'm, I'm not sure if I have a, a question or a reflection, but I want to thank you both for your very um, interesting presentations. My name is Tian Ung. I'm the director of the Urban Leadership Program at the Simmons School of Social Work. And the way I like to think about each of your areas of work is its uh, translation or application back um, to the field at a programming level. And so from that perspective, I see sort of merit from, from both positions rather than you know, this and or position that seems to be um, the beginning part of our discourse. So um, to that effect, your work, Dr. Thayer, informs very important understanding at the program level about outcomes. Um, and so in that context, the impact on the client, what we, sh what sh we should be doing. Um, to improve client incomes and the uh, outcomes, excuse me, and the impact on them. Yet simultaneously, in my program, as um, an educator who's trying to prepare our social work leaders relative to programming decisions um, around staffing, around funding, around um, deployment of resources and social workers, I also need to understand a lot about what your work is about, Dr. Folk, in t relative to you know, what were the processes underlying those outcomes? You know, how can I understand more about what, what I need to be doing at the organizational level um, relative to my source, my, my resources, my funding, my staffing, right, um, in order to, to, to reach those outcomes, which, which I don't think is always um, answered in just outcome research alone, but, but I do see the need for both in order to effectuate to excellent practice. Thank you for that. I, I do want to say that in the at the Helsinki conference, the talk that I gave was about the way in which clinical data mining can help in understanding contextual factors like the ones that you mentioned, because data about contextual factors is often part of the database that we're working with, whereas in RCTs, the intention is to strip away those contextual factors. It's not about one versus the other, because the RCT does tell you something different. Okay. Other questions or comments? Hello, I'm Sharon Lamley from England. I'm interested, Jan, in your <coughs> presentation. Actually, I've seen you present before, so I've got the same I've got it. <laughs> okay. Similar, I got the same. <laughs> Um, and I'm interested in context, um, particularly in the UK, the policy developments are all around the shift 
paradigm towards service user involvement and co-design, etc. But I wondered, because um, my colleague and I have worked on supervision research and the boundaries um, around uh, service user involvement in professional practices. And so I was interested in your presentation from that perspective and wondered, is there any mileage in capturing critical reflection from a service user experience expectation um, or is this just outside the professional kind of agenda? And I, I, I find that quite an interesting area, perhaps. Yeah, and a good question. And, and this is a very English question, isn't it, or a UK question, because service user involvement is a big part of our policy. Can I say again, it's not either or. Um, often when I present this material, uh, people say, you know, I can see how I can use this with service users. I have to say my mission has been to use it with practitioners because frankly I think practitioners are overlooked um, as a group who basically need to have their voice heard. Uh, and I, I mean, I do think we have to have outcome studies. I, I'm not against that. I think the problem is that unless we understand in depth what makes up the practitioner's experience, it's very difficult to participate, for them to participate in program changes in a way that they understand and works for them in terms of their experience. So I would see critical reflection working very well with, say, an evaluation of a program where you were looking to see how you would roll out the program better, and then there might be a room for incorporating a service user perspectives on that as well, using critical reflection. So what's been their experience? What are the assumptions that they make about the service or that they make about the workers who are working with them? Is there any disparity between them, etc., etc.? It has worked very well using it in, in interprofessional working because what you find is that when people talk about what their deep assumptions are, obviously they have deep assumptions about other people they're working with and those are the things that often get in the way and do colour the way they work. So I can see that working really well with hearing service users' voices as well. But I have to say, I focused on the practitioner voice because I think there's an awful lot of work to do there. But it's not that other people can't go out and use it in more broadly and in other kinds of ways. We have time for one more question. Well, we have time for two more questions. <laughs> Rosalie, and... Yeah. No, no, weren't you? Oh, I'm sorry, you were... Oh, you were being empathic. I see. <laughs> Is it my turn first? Go, go, okay. go first, and then there's somebody right. in the back. Um, Keith Miller from Australia, uh, in fact, from Adelaide. Um, a question, I'm really interested in the, in the idea of uh, practitioner research and engaging with people in agencies. Um, in terms of uh, sort of what you were talking about, Bruce, um, as well as Jan, but the sense of the clinical data mining, um, to what degree do you think, or how do you go about it if, if you, you're not able to get ethic, ethical approval for engaging in research for data that's already been collected. Yeah. That's an issue I've struggled with at my university, um, and I don't know how you go about that. It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're a university faculty member and your IRB won't let you do the study and you can't figure out a way to massage it so they will agree, you don't do it. But what you could do is have somebody else do it who's not associated with your university, and you could be the consultant. It's striking to me, if I, if my, I may add my, my experience here, is that it varies considerably from country to country, from organization to organization. So, for example, we have no problem about, as long as we de-identify the data, it's often the case that ethics committees or IRBs will simply say, you know, why are you even asking us as long as you de-identify the data? Uh, but in other countries, I think people are much more uh, cautious about how the data will be used and so on. And, and it's been different from hospital to hospital in my experience in Australia. Question back there. There's one more question. Yes. yes. My question is to Jan Hook. 
um, I understand critical reflection. My name is Anne Halvorsen and I'm from Norway. Uh, I understand critical reflection as a way of learning. And learning, you talked about learning in the organization. And I'm, I'm a bit, uh, if you could elaborate a bit on the goal of um, critical reflection um, and learning as an organization. You said something about it also makes a difference for the organization. And I was wondering, how do you make sure that critical reflection also has a bearing on how the organization functions? And how do you know that it does a difference? Yeah, th this is a very good question. And actually, this question is at the cutting edge, I think, for critical reflection as a learning method at the moment. Because most people recognise it, it was, has been developed as an individual method of learning. There's been very little work done on how it happens at organisational level. Um, I suppose I, the way I approach that question is I see critical reflection as helping practitioners think about their assumptions about their own place in the organisation. Okay, so it isn't ever just personal. But what am I assuming about my organisation and where I fit and therefore how I can work? And what they find when they think about the question from that point of view is that they often make many assumptions about the organisation it not being able to change or them not having any agency. Now when they turn those on their head, they actually go out and do different things which make the organisation change. I am going to, I hate myself, I'm going to say this, I only have anecdotal evidence about that, but that is what a lot of practitioners say to me. Um, I think there, there is a bit of a problem because many managers ask only front nine practitioners to learn critical reflection. It's very rarely the managers who do it. So it's assumed that it's front line practitioners who need to reflect, nobody else does. So actually getting the, the changes up to higher levels is difficult. And that's, so I, I do a lot of uh, critical reflection training across London now and we have a network working on this and this is the next level that they actually want to work on. Some of them are kind of junior level managers but they want to influence higher up. So yeah, no, no, diff, no answers to this one yet but certainly we're working on it. Oh, um, the uh, ethical, yeah. yeah. You know, I was going to say, Keith, to that question about ethics, I think it's a big problem in Australia and the UK. Highly bureaucratic. And I think a lot of research doesn't get done because of that. What's the way around it? Reframing, creative reframing. Yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to have to draw this to a close. Sorry, Rosalie. You'll have other opportunities. I do want to point, while I'm talking about time, to point out to the moderators that there are going to be time cards on, on the tables for you to use. Partly because I hated going to conferences where people would tear up little bits of paper and, and write the time on it. Now, I'm expecting that you will leave these time cards on the table. At the end of the conference, you can take them home for faculty meetings. <laughs> but for now, leave them on the table. Uh, I do want to thank our speakers. This was a wonderful way to begin. And look forward to serving